can we live a daring faith in a cowardly world? Let's talk about it with Ken Harrison on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad you're here. Uh, I say it over and over again, and I mean it over and over again. You always have a place at our table. I'm Steve, in case you're wondering, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter, our executive producer, is here. Matthew uh, always gets nervous when his wife shops at those really expensive stores, like the grocery store and the gas station. (laughs) (laughs) And our producer, Jinx, is working hard in his little glass booth for dinner tonight, Jinx is making kale surprise. <laughs> Jinx, what's the surprise? I'm using bacon instead of kale. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, man. We weren't meant to eat that stuff. My cows eat kale. <laughs> One man IT department, John Myers, is in his tech bunker. John is sick right now, suffering through a rare case of Pac-Man fever. (laughs) Actually, that's not what it is. He's just now getting over COVID. And it is only because he read Ken's book that he had the courage (laughs) to stand up and to do what God called him to, and that was to run this program. Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George believes there are two rules for success. Number one, Don't share everything you know. (laughs) And Kathy Wyatt is the soft (laughs) feminine side of the program. (laughs) Kathy says some folks are like old TVs. You have to smack them a few times before they get the picture. And she's been (laughs) doing that with me for a lot of years. It hasn't worked. (laughs) And it hasn't worked yet, but she's working at it. One of my favorite people in the world is Ken Harrison. Uh, uh, (laughs) I'm big on grace. He's big on get it done. Uh, (laughs) Somewhere between the two of us, there is radical truth. Uh, I got out of bed this morning and Ken changed the world. (laughs) And both of us did what we could. Ken serves as chairman and president of Promise Keep. going to talk about that a little bit. Some of you wondered what happened to Promise Keepers. Man, it was sweeping the country, and then all of a sudden we turned around and couldn't find them. But Ken found them, and you're going to hear a great story. He's also chairman and president of of, uh, Waterstone. That's an organization that helps clients give away millions of dollars to Christian humanitarian efforts. I've been begging Ken to give me a couple of million, but (laughs) (laughs) you'll waste it. I'm not going to do that. Ken, by the way, served as a police officer in L.A., and that's a big deal. And he spent two decades in commercial real estate and very successful. He's appeared on numerous media outlets, including 700 Club, Fox News, The Blaze TV, The Huckabee Show, And Ken's newest book, which I hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, is A Daring Faith in a Cowardly World. Um, And uh, speaking of my nicotine, uh, Ken has uh, reminded people at Key Life Uh, that the reason I uh, don't get COVID isn't because of my purity or a mask or a shot. It's because I smoke a pipe. Mm 
<laughs> I didn't know that for sure, but now I feel much better about doing it. And I wish all of you very spiritual people would leave me alone. <laughs> Ken, uh, you, I, when you told me you were going to uh, see if you could revive promise, promise keepers, I, I said something really pastoral and loving and kind. I said to you, Ken, are you a fruitcake? What in the world have you been smoking? And you said, and this will shut my mouth every time. God told me to do it, and I may mess it up, but I'm going to do it. Ken, tell that story, how that came about and the commitment you made at the beginning. You know, I hate people who say God told me to do it because usually they're and not accurate, but in my case, <laughs> it was undeniable. I was teaching men's discipleship groups all over Denver, and a, a man walked in one day and said he needed help with promise keepers. And I said, that's still a thing? <laughs> and, uh, I really, you know. And uh, he asked me to come on the board, and I literally said, I want no part of a dead organization. And um, and then finally he came to me and said, look, I haven't been paid in a year, and I desperately need your help, and I'm 78 years old, and I want to retire so I went to one board meeting um, just to help out my friend, Raleigh Washington. And when I saw their financials, I was furiated and told them what I thought, which Steve, you know, we've been friends for 32 years. You know, I tell people what I think. And um, when I got done ranting and raving, they made me chairman of the board. <laughs> and, uh, I, I became chairman. Of That'll teach you. I could close it. Yeah. So I, I brought it in to close it. I, we paid off all the debt Waterstone did for promise keepers. And on the day that we were going to close it, this man came up to meet with me and he begged me in tears, do not close promise keepers. And I said, Lord, I've never prayed this before, but I was at a small coffee shop in the middle of nowhere. If this is from you, I need something because the devil could really use this to waste a lot of time. And uh, this guy's convincing me to keep promise keepers open. And just at that moment, the president who works for me at Waterstone, that foundation, who's 70 years old, extremely conservative, walked into that coffee shop. I said, John, what are you doing here? And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, that's crazy. It was 630 in the morning. He sits down and I said, Stan, would you tell John what you just told me? He told John what he had told me. And John said, after about five minutes, sounds like you better not close promise keepers. Hmm. So the Lord really supernaturally affirmed that. And you know, Dr. Jody Dillo, whom I've had such respect for, says, you know, there's eight voices of God and one of them is people. Hmm. And uh, in that case, I think it was pretty clear uh, from the Lord to keep promise keepers open. Did that keep you awake at the beginning? I mean, that was an awesome. I mean, you were telling me the plans that you had and I was thinking, good heavens, <laughs> that's too much. Uh, you uh, that has got. Even you, Ken, that had to scare you a little bit. You know, Steve, honestly, and, and you know I'm an old, you know, Calvary Chapel Baptist guy. So, you know, there's a supernatural story I tell in the book about God speaking to me very you know, all of a sudden in my prayer closet. And I said, God, you're not supposed to talk to me. I'm a Baptist. <laughs> um, but uh, I did have another moment like that. About two months in, I had people calling me from all over, people I'd never met. You know, when Franklin Graham and Tony Evans and people are calling you out of the blue, it's weird when you're just a normal guy. And I, I suddenly realized the magnitude of what I had agreed to. And uh, I said, I don't think I'm up to this. And I heard God's voice clearly in my ear say, I've been preparing you for this your whole life. Yeah. And like I said, I'm not some guy where God talks to me all the time, but I got it that time. And uh, he has done incredible things. We had an event at Dallas Cowboy Stadium last summer. At the height of COVID, we had 30,000 people there. Um, the, the Washington Post wrote a big article on it. Couldn't believe that we had gotten many people together in, in the middle of COVID. We had, had Were they US positive? The Washington was, Post? No, I mean, it was, it was actually oh. pretty positive. <laughs> It was pretty shocking. You said COVID and positive. You threw me off. There. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it was a Super big deal. Spreader. And, you know, we had to suspend those plans that I told you about in 2020 because because uh, I actually made a video saying we would not stop. We were going to have our event. And Governor Abbott's office called me and said, you're not having your event. 
you're going to be met with police officers with guns not letting you in the door. So we did a virtual event. And Steve, that virtual event was seen by 1.4 million people around the world in 83 countries. Hmm. And it was strong gospel preaching. And uh, so God, God will do what he will do. He just asks us to obey. And, uh, and I often say his favorite word is wait. And I, I, I don't hear that word very often. I have a hard time <laughs> with that word. But uh, he's done great things. It's been amazing. It wasn't what I thought, but it has been amazing. And uh, you feel positive about Promise Keepers and what God's going to do with it. We had a virtual event. We've been doing them about two or three times a year. You can get them at promisekeepers.org. One was on sexual integrity, and it was an hour long. We had 88,000 people watch it live, not including twice on on two different TV networks. And at the end, we had a uh, 30-day challenge where we went intensely into sexual sin, perversion, pornography. You know, we had 5,000... For 5,000 men, Steve, watch that event. And I'm getting emails still from guys saying, I'm completely healed. I was addicted to pornography since the age of nine. Now I'm 65, gone through three marriages, screwed up kids. I'm finally healed. I was ugly crying. When you get those kinds of emails, boy, I tell you, it makes it all worth it. Oh, it does. Guys, you don't want to miss a bit of this. Uh, this has the smell of Jesus about it. Uh, and when Jesus come, things happen. And uh, what's happening here is amazing. The name of the book is A Daring Faith in a Cowardly World. And it would be a good book for you to study in your church at a men's group. Um, hey, we're gonna come back just like Jesus. for joining us uh we're talking with ken harrison and his latest book is called the daring faith in a cowardly world live a life without waste or anything unfinished ken uh you open the book with you just throw the reader right into it with um kind of a traumatic incident that happened to you. And uh, there's a little bit of tension that's not there because you did make it through and wrote the book. So I knew you were going <laughs> to, I knew you were going to come through this thing. Um, but Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> it lives. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could tell us about that event and how it kind of ushered you toward uh, what ended up being the underlying premise of the book. You know, um, one of the things I, preach and talk about all the time is the importance of knowing your identity in Christ. And all of us have wrong notions about who we really are. And that's one of the reasons why God tests us to show us and reveal to us who we are and where we need to work on ourselves. So having been a cop in South Central Los Angeles, you know, which is Watts Compton area and been through lots of shootings and, and traumatic incidents, I thought I was pretty uh, death, whatever. But then I was hit by a jet ski and I was in the hospital and the doctor said to me, look, if you've destroy it. You've, you've ruptured your liver. If less than 40% is destroyed, we're going to life let you out of here. Cut it out. It'll grow back. If more than 40% is destroyed, you have five hours to live. Have a nice day. So <laughs> he, uh, he walks out of the room and for about an hour while I'm waiting for my results, I'm thinking in, in five hours, I might be meeting Christ. And I had been a boy of intense and Steve knows this from us being longtime friends, but I was raising that extreme legalistic background where if it's fun, it's a sin. And um, so I had at 12 because I really was saved at five years old, loved the Bible, really immersed myself in scripture from the time I was 12. So I knew the Bible very well. Here I was 30 years old, laying on this gurney thinking, when I see Jesus in five hours, what am I going to say? If he says, what did you do with what I gave you? I'm not going to have much I can say. I mean, I'm, I'm married. I never cheated on my wife. And I was a policeman. And uh, well, Ken, who's saved because of you? Who, who has got food now because of you? Whose life has been changed? What alcoholic's life has been changed? What stripper who was suicidal? Tell me those people who are different because you were on the earth. And I would have nothing to say. 
But I, I, I thought, you know, no one's ever taught me that theology. Why did I, my mind go there? It's because the Holy Spirit had taught me that theology. I had in scripture all along read over and over and over crazy words that no one had explained to me, like Jesus saying, you're going to be judged on your works. Jesus saying, if you're not willing to say goodbye to all your possessions, you're not worthy of me. Well, as Steve knows, I'm big into grace, just like he is. If John 3.16 says the entire salvation message, if you believe you're saved, which I believe, then what are all the rest of the words about? What's the Sermon on the Mount about where Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out of your head, huh? Is it? And there are some people who wrote, have written books, Steve and I knows exactly who I'm talking about, that basically all of Jesus's really harsh words are you trying to show yourself that you actually believe. It's almost like he was written by a tyrant. No, Jesus's words, he wrote, wasn't kidding. And I, and I want to get the reader to realize that what Jesus said, he wasn't kidding about. If you believe you really are saved, no matter what. and over here, we see the Sermon on the Mount. He pulls the disciples away from the crowds. He sits down with the 12 and says, if you want to be holy, if you want to have all the joy, the rewards, the power that comes from knowing me, this is the recipe. It's not about salvation. It's not about showing that you're good enough. But if you really want to go to the highest level, because what I realized is with salvation becomes unmerited acceptance by God, but we don't get unmerited approval. Approval is something that we earn. He's a father. We're children. For, with our kids, don't we, don't we always accept them no matter what? We would never throw them out of the family. But we're more proud of them at some times than others. And the ones who are about our business are going to get a co-inheritance. The ones who are not about our business, we still love them. We would never throw them out. But they would not receive all the blessings of being a, a son or daughter of the father that they would. And that's exactly how his relationship with us, is with us. And as you know, uh, I have some uh, not because I think Jesus didn't say him, he did. It's just because the people I encounter uh, are often people who think that God's angry at them, that he's through with them. Uh, for instance, Jim Robinson, who wrote the introduction or the preface to your book, uh, early in his ministry, crashed and burned. I mean, big time. Mm. Uh, mm. I'm on the edge of that a lot. And we have 4,000 pastors on our mailing list. And I listen to what they say. And I, you know, kind of like your friend who said, I didn't like your book, but every bit of it is biblical. It really is. Uh, I know where I'm called and I know where I failed. And if God's blessing is hinged on my success and following him, I'm in trouble. Uh, and I just don't. But as I said at the beginning of the program, uh, you're in to get it done and I'm in to get it forgiven. And somewhere, as long as we stay together and preach in the same pulpit, God's people are going to hear the truth. And I'm going to be better than I generally am, frankly. And I can't help it. I really am. And so as I read your book, I check off some things and say, been there, done that, was faithful there, and not so much there. That's the place where I really blew it, and I haven't told anybody. Uh, and, I, and I think that the Christian faith isn't just you're saved by the gospel. You're, you live by the gospel. Uh, and uh, and so um, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is at the bottom, and I know it is yours too. By the way, you even when you listen to me, you can't disagree. And when I listen to you, I can't disagree. And I don't know how we've been friends for so long <laughs> when you could be so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> George. Uh, well, it's because he's not a Presbyterian, right? That's <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Missed it by that much. Uh, Ken, we're we're running out of time in this segment. I, I'm I'm interested in, you know, um, and you've talked about hearing from God, and and I know that that's not necessarily audible, per se. But um, I'd be interested in you talking about the role of the Spirit in this. Um, 
work of salvation and moving on. You know, it's it's only by faith you're saved. You're arguing, um, you know, you're called to more uh, after you get past that. Talk about the role of the Spirit in the heart of the believer and, and how that gets them toward what your, um, what your premise is in your book. And I have to do that on the other side of the break, but I'd be interested in that. I would be too. Good. Well, now I'll have time to prepare because you're going to give me three minutes to figure out an answer. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to back up. Our, our Ken Harrison is our, uh, is our guest. you got to get this book. It's a convicting book, and it's not easy to read sometimes. But if ever a book was written for a time like ours, this is it. Christians are hiding behind their religion. They've been silenced and censored. And uh, King says, shout at the top of your lungs. I'm mad as, and I'm not going (laughs) to take it anymore. Thanks for joining us. We're hanging out with my friend, Ken Harrison. You can keep up with Ken's work at promisekeepers.org and on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram at Ken R. H. Uh, R. Harrison. Ken R. Harrison. Listen, I'm old. I'm doing the best I can, George. Uh, Ken, uh, some uh, just taking perhaps a glancing view of your book might say, okay, um, salvation is by faith alone. When it comes to salvation, you got to get busy. You know, it's all up to you. But there really is a role for the Spirit uh, in the believer's life. Talk about that and the indwelling Spirit and how that makes a difference. Well, and I have learned that. I think um, if you want to get holy, you have to learn to depend on the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, Steve mentioned earlier sort of the foundational message of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, um, that you're saved by grace through faith. And then even the faith you have is a gift from God so that nobody can boast. But Ephesians 2, 10, the next verse says, where God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which were prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So each one of us, every one of us on this call, everyone listening to this has good works that God laid down at the foundation of the time for us to accomplish. Well, how do we know what those are? That's always the follow-up question. If if I have a mission in my life, what are those and how do I know? Well, I think Romans 12, 1 and 2 puts us on the right path. If we are transformed and not conformed to this world, then we'll know the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. So how do we know God's will? We know it by not conforming to the world and being transformed to accomplish the good works that we have. And Jesus says in Revelation 22, 12, behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to reward each person according to what he's done. According to salvation, no, salvation is we just found out even the faith we have to believe in God is a gift from him. But after salvation, how have we done to accomplish God's good works. And I think there's two things that come off of this as a byproduct. Number one, there is a point to my life. And I think a lot of Christians are saying, well, what's the point? Because the cheap grace that Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about a lot, you know, belief without repentance, the cheap grace message that has been heard is, you're just a bad person, but God loves you anyway. Now go have a nice day. Well, that doesn't sound very satisfying and it isn't. There's something lacking there. It's 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 ninety nine percent of the truth. You are a bad person, and God does love you anyway. But you do have a point to your life, right? The second one is when we understand that God rewards those who have been about His business, like a loving father rewards his children. We get to be a lot less judgmental, because I think there's a lot of people like spoiled children saying, "God, you know, look at that person. They're, they smoke a pipe. How bad are they?" Right? <laughs> I gotta I gotta make sure God knows. Well, if we understand that He is not just merciful but also just. 
we don't need to worry about is sort of like C.S. Lewis continues to say in the Chronicles of Narnia, which I've been reading to my wife for the third time in our 32 year long marriage. <laughs> you know, a lot of that message is worry about yourself, not about anybody else. Aslan comes along and says, that's not your story. That's so that's Peter's story, right? So we get to worry about ourselves and not be so worried about everybody else. When we understand that we have a mission from him, we were saved for good works and that he's going to reward us based on how we've done on those good works. Not there's not condemnation. His grace is full, but so is his justice and his rewards. Hmm. I, uh, I hear what you're saying. I'm, I'm not going to get much of a reward, uh, but I'm going to get there. <laughs> and I'm not saying that to be authentic or humble. I, I really do face some things that I struggle with. Do you think that sometimes, and Ken, uh, you are the most get it done guy I know, whether you're a cop in L.A., or whether you're raising millions of dollars or selling million dollar houses or running promise keepers, you are type A on steroids. Mm. And it's a part of your nature. It's who you are. It's what you do. You need to know I'm a type Z. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I, you know, if it, if it weren't for what Jesus did for me, I would leave because uh, I wouldn't do this for anybody but Jesus. But I'm still here, and I read your book, and I'm thinking, Lord, uh, search me and know me and check out the stuff that's evil so I can be faithful to you. And I have that. You never met a man who wants to please God more than I do. And you probably never met a guy who doesn't as often as I do. And I think I, I'm for your message clearly spoken as long as you have the addendum of grace. Mm -hmm. Buddy Green in the early days of Promise Keepers was called to uh, sing and they wanted him to sing a song of impact and changing the world. And he said, I'm not going to do it. He said, we're not promise keepers, we're promise breakers, and I'm going to sing a song of grace. And uh, they got together, prayed about it, and Jesus said, let that boy go, because they got to hear that too. And I know you agree with that. I'm not saying something you disagree with. Uh, we were going to turn to Kathy, because her question will be the most profound of this entire broadcast. Uh, but I talk too much, so I'm going to shut up. And this is hard work. Have some cookies and milk and rest up, and then we're going to come back and go at it again. And the name of the book is A Daring Faith in a Cowardly World. And it is a convicting book, but it's an important book, and it's a timely book. In fact, Ken wouldn't like for me to say it. I think he's a prophet. Up for a time like this. Hey, don't go away. We're coming back. talking to uh, Ken Harrison. And uh, if I all of a sudden have turned African American, it's because the lights here in my study that we use for this program just went out. I remember early in the Jesus movement, a kid giving his testimony and he said, I didn't backslide. Uh, I And out. <laughs> so that's a message for God designed for me, especially through this book, A Daring Faith in a Cowardly World. Ken, I, uh, and I believe you are a prophet with a side gift of encouragement, uh, but you are also in your face. And I think it's time that Christians start doing that. Christians have been silenced. 
we're hated in a lot of places. Uh, we're rejected and demeaned and marginalized. And uh, I think this is a book that we've got to read. And we need to say, look, we got to say whose side we're on, stand up and be counted and be what God called us to be. You get you know, a lot of people think you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny. <laughs> By the way, you have a voice that's deeper than mine. No. But however, <laughs> I am better looking than you are. <laughs> <laughs> but you really, you know, a lot of people really don't like you at all. How do you deal with that sort of thing? Well, when you're a cop at 21 in Los Angeles during Rodney King, you get early training. <laughs> I realize that just because I'm standing for truth and righteousness and justice doesn't mean I'm going to be popular. And, uh, and, and you and I both said that, you know, um, they say you judge a man by his friends. I, I say it's more accurate to judge a man by his enemies, you know, yeah. who hates you and why. And I'm, I'm real happy with who my enemies are, but yeah, I was getting massive hate mail. Um, I was on a TV show and said, where are the Christians who are standing up against this transgender movement? And um, I got mail. You couldn't believe. I mean, people tell me they're going to kill me. Where does this guy live? And I was my wife was reading me some of this and I kind of chuckled and I thought, you know, they're going to find I'm a little harder to kill than your average Christian leader. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not, they're gonna, I mean, fine, I'm not what they expect. But also I started laughing and I said, baby, you know, the people who are writing this stuff are sitting in their underwear, screaming at mom for their meatloaf. You know, these are not <laughs> serious people. But on the Christian side, too, I, I get hostility because they don't think they really understand. And it comes from a couple sides. One of the things I point out a lot is Hebrews uh, chapter 11, the hall of faith. And what we find out in, about those people is you have Rahab, the prostitute. And you have Japheth, who shows up with some really bad theology and kills his daughter to please God. What did all those people have in common? Well, two things. The first one is they were really screwed up, but they repented. And the second one was none of them ever backed down from a fight. All of them said, whatever you have, Lord, I'll go. And so they were filled with passion and sin and life. And yet they were about father's business. And so I do want to make it clear. And I do in the book where we have this calling from Ephesians 2.10. And God has gifted us to take care of our calling. And it may be that you're type A like me and you build big companies and you are a policeman in violent areas. It may be that your calling is to raise godly children. And Malachi chapter three says, God hates divorce. Why? Because he wants jealous. He wants godly offspring. It wouldn't be a higher calling than having a godly generation coming up. My friend, Ross Mason, very type A, he was a world-class triathlete, was in an accident and woke up as a, as a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. You know that Ross today, 13 years after that accident, is the most powerful prayer I've ever come to. And he thanks God every day for his accident because he said, Ken, I was so busy that I would, I would have missed God for my whole life. Now I sit in this chair and I pray for people every day. And I'm telling you, if you need prayer, you call Ross Mason and that boy, he'll, I mean, I told him, you're never allowed to say grace, Ross, because the food will be cold. <laughs> he can pray like nobody I've ever seen. And he thanks the Lord for being paralyzed. So God gives us the grace to accomplish his mission. He's not looking for perfect people. He's just looking for people who will have a daring faith and move forward. That is so good, Ken. So good. Kathy? Oh. Uh, Ken, I am. Um... It's hard for me to envision, you know, you come along and, and God makes it very clear that you're, that you're supposed to run this thing that has just died pretty close to died. Um, you, you get together the people that you think are going to help with this. You move forward. Um, COVID hits. So you have to do everything online, et cetera. And then, and things be, and now we're hopefully like on the other side of of all of that, what is the direction that you see that you feel like God is leading and directing? I think everybody knows, you know, what promise keepers did before, you know, you rent the biggest state stadium in the world and you put 90 bazillion men in it and you challenge them to be godly men, which is a great, I mean, that's a great thing. I'm not, not, you know, trying to minimalize that in any way, but what is the direction? Where are you going? What are the, are there things that you're trying to resurrect from what was quintessentially promise keepers before? Are there new things? Where are you going? 
I, you know, I love that question, Kathy, how you, we start off with promise keepers and then we'll end with promise keepers. Cause it is a great question. And um, I wish I could say I had this definitive plan because I did have one and God wasn't interested in it. <laughs> and so I have learned though, that huge stadium events, they may come back, but they're not back right now. And what we have found is doing these virtual events, as I was mentioning the numbers earlier, we're getting, you know, around a hundred thousand people watching them live when we launched them and up to about half a million will watch them the, over the next few months. The, pro, the criticism of promise keepers in the nineties, which was unfair, which was that, you know, we'd fill a football stadium with 80,000 men and then they would leave there ready to charge hell with a bucket of water, but they would get to hell. They didn't know what to do with the bucket because there was no one to disciple them. And that was all promise keepers fault. Well, how was that? How was promise keepers supposed to do that? But actually now we can. So there, we have an app. The app has massive usage. The average user on our app uses it three times longer than the average user of Facebook. We have huge engagements. So anybody could download the app and get really godly content. Steve knows I'm a huge Andrew Murray fan. So you'll see a bunch of Andrew Murray stuff on there, but you can go in and get and find specific programming on being a father, a husband, how to raise daughters, how to raise sons, sexual healing, pornography is destroying the church. We have one coming out in November on mental health. How do I deal with grief? How do I deal with depression? How do I deal with a spouse who's bipolar or a child who's bipolar? So we're putting out really, Godly content because Promise Keepers is such a trusted name. We can get stuff into people's hands that maybe they wouldn't get from somewhere else. Because as I said to Franklin Graham, there's something about Billy Graham and Promise Keepers that nobody else that I know of has, which is complete acceptance across all denominational lines from Catholics to Presbyterians, from Pentecostals to Southern Baptists. Everyone loves Promise Keepers. And we're also uniquely hated by the left. I mean, I don't know why, but hmm. well, I do know why. But they hate promise keepers. I think with that branding, we have the ability to get information to people's hands that they might not necessarily get otherwise. Oh man, that is so good. Ken, we're out of time. Uh, but uh, you know, I you I sometimes say to guests, don't you shilly shally. <laughs> you don't have to say that. You're, no, this is it. Listen. Get uh, some rest. You don't have to say that. <laughs> listen, take a break and go to a movie occasionally, okay? <laughs> and then don't shilly shally when the movie. Ken, you're a gift to the church. Thank you for spending this time with us. Hope we you can do it again. You. <laughs> Guys, don't go anywhere. When we come back, we're going to tell you who we're going to do it unto next week. And I'm going to try to fix this light. Pray. <laughs> Ken Harrison. I love that guy. And I really believe he's anointed of God. And you know, what he teaches runs very counter to some of the things that I teach. And yet I know that God anoints. I feel kind of about Ken and he would die if he knew I said this because politically they're not in the same boat. But Tony Campolo has exactly that same kind of effect on me. We don't agree on anything but Jesus, but I believe Tony had a message that people needed to hear. And by the way, I talked to him last week, and uh, he's going through a very rough time after a major stroke. So if you think of it, say a prayer. But what I was saying was that Ken does that to me, too. I know his voice uh, is the voice that I have learned to hear from God himself. I know we're living in a time when we can't afford to be cowards, that if we belong to Jesus, we need to stand up and say, it will co be cold in hell before you silence me. Because I'm, I'm going to talk kindly and gently. I'm going to try to love you, but I'm not going to shut up. Um, and, uh, and you're going to have to deal with that because God has called me 
to speak and live out this message. And essentially, that's what Ken does. Uh, and it's what he says in this book. And he gives practical, down-to-earth answers on how to do it. And uh, Ken wanted me to be a part of this at the beginning, <laughs> to be on his board. I said, what if I screw up publicly in the middle of that and bring shame on promise keepers? Uh, he said, you won't. You're too old. <laughs> but I decided it's best I pray for him rather than I be involved in a ministry of doing things right because I have a ministry of doing things wrong and telling people that Jesus likes me anyway and in fact likes me about 10% more than he likes every <laughs> Well, good hour. I always am refreshed when I'm with Ken. Um, Kathy, who's going to be on next week? Next week, our friend Tom Wood is going to be with us. And uh, we've talked with Tom before, and he is he has a, a solo book. Out. He's um, co-authored a couple of them in the past, but he's got a solo book out now. It's titled Vital Grace, Getting Everything from Nothing. So uh, <laughs> Tom will be with us next week. And uh, you don't want to miss that, too. Tom is a pastor coach. He's started a bunch of churches, and he's been my friend for 35 years when nobody else would be. So I look forward to seeing him. We'll be back same time, same place next week. Hope you join us. Between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. That gives you a wide, wide berth.